Welcome to Truest Blood, the official True Blood podcast. I'm Kristen Bauer. And I'm Deborah Ann Wool. And you've been invited in. I want to do bad things with you. On Truest Blood. Welcome back to Truest Blood, where we sink our fangs into the series episode by episode. This week we break down 109, Kristen. <laughs> <laughs> It's called Placier de Moor, written by Brian Buckner and directed by Anthony Hemingway. We all go a little mad sometimes, and this week, <laughs> Amy Burley lets her psycho flag fly. We also talk with the exceptional Carrie Preston about what it was like to play a human in this crazy world of vampires. Of course, we will also cover all the Bon Top drama and go behind the scenes with Michael Arbogast, our special effects foreman, to get the scoop mm -hmm. on all that blood. But first, Kristen. This week on True Blood. As Long Shadow strangles Sookie and prepares to bite, Bill grabs a beer tap and stakes him just in time. Blood erupts all over Sookie, causing Ginger to devolve into her signature hysterics. Humans. <coughs> Honestly, Bill, I don't know what you see in them. Eric is not impressed, and he warns Bill that there will be consequences for this action. Amy and Jason take their relationship to the next level, that being felony, kidnapping, and false imprisonment. Despite Jason's qualms, V and Amy are too strong a temptation, and Eddie is left to watch. Miss Jeanette continues to work her angles on Tara and knows all the ways to get under her skin. Your loneliness is spreading to your eyes. It's becoming a part of who you are. Sam tries to make up with Tara, and she admits that despite her skepticism, she's considering the exorcism. Seeing how unhappy she is, Sam convinces her to let him give her the money. Meanwhile, Bill and Sookie arrive home from Fantasia to another nasty surprise. Tina, Sookie's beloved cat, is the latest victim of the town serial killer. Jason, feeling sorry for Eddie, tries to convince Amy to treat him more humanely, but she refuses. He then decides to spend some time with their captive and discovers that Eddie has quite a bit of wisdom to share, wisdom he could have used growing up. Just the boy needs a man in his life. Teach him what it means to be a man. They bond. Unfortunately, things turn ugly when Eddie tries to warn Jason about the real Amy. Quite taken with her and possibly in love, Jason storms out, but still returns with a six-pack of true blood. That night, the Fantasia twosome, Eric and Pam, and their new bartender Chow pay a visit to Bill. The time has come to pay the piper, and Bill must answer for his crime of staking another vamp. They allow him a tearful goodbye with Sookie before marching him to an unknown fate. If I had any feelings, I'd have the chills right about now. Not me. Bill asks Sam to watch over Sookie, but she will have none of it and instead goes to stay at Bill's, where she is greeted by Dean the dog. They fall asleep together, and when Sookie rouses later that night in Dean's place, lies a buck naked Sam Merlot. <laughs> Oh my God, Naked Samurai Lot. We're finally getting to the the shifters, the new yeah. stuff here. Woo. Oh, this is big. This is really it's big. It's been a long time coming. This is like the slowest, one of the slowest teases of the first season. So much foreplay. Well, so much. I'm 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 totally ready. Um, <laughs> but we will get into all of it next week. But next it's week. starting. It's starting. We'll yep, get into it's it. It's begun. We're gonna talk to Sam. We're gonna get all of the details. Yeah, we're talking to Sam. Ooh, it's going to be cool. Uh, but I think, yeah, I just want to sort of do a, a quick sort of shout out to Steve and Anna for uh, that scene that they do in bed after they discover Tina. It's, uh, isn't it, it's really lovely. And, you know, we've said this yeah. before, but watching them work together, mm -hmm. it is like watching them fall in love a little bit. <laughs> I hope I they don't mind my know, saying that. No, I hope they don't mind us saying it but say they were married to other people and hated each other i know the right. scenes would be just as great because yes, they're so they're professional. good actors yes they're, they're great but 
Yeah. Really? This, I mean, so I guess in my mind, I'm working backwards and I'm seeing <laughs> such incredible strength and tenderness in both of them yeah. and humor that then yeah. I work backwards. And because I've seen it also with them in person. So they're just incredible yeah. individually and together, right? Yes, they are. And and I think too, it, it just continues to highlight the choices that Anna is making for Sookie. Mm. I'm mm-hmm. so impressed with them. She shows such strength, mm-hmm. but tenderness as well. And she doesn't mm-hmm. let Bill get away with anything. Right. And it would be very easy because he's immortal, yes. right? He could break her body in half with his little pinky and he's male. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kudos to everybody from Charlene to Alan yeah. to Anna to kind of mix that up. Well, it would also be easy to go more cliche and really mm-hmm. chastise him, you know, like put him in his place for right. condescending to her. But again, Anna's choice is very firm, mm-hmm. but it is also, again, sort of welcomes him into the conversation rather than shutting him down. What if wanting to be protected makes me feel like the helpless little girl I used to be all over again? You know, I, I think it's such a great description of, again, that kind of protective, again, trope, as we've mm-hmm. mentioned before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think most women, I should say most actors um, who have kind of had that, we all have that, you know, I can protect myself. I can take care of myself kind of right. line. Right. And this just feels like a really lovely, specific way to describe mm-hmm. why that protection trope feels so condescending in many ways yeah and it just doesn't feel right to her she's so authentic when she says it and that line then that comes where she says your face is about the only thing getting me through right now I'm like oh Oh, right it gets me yeah there it reminds me too of the moment in the last episode in the bathtub where Mm. she's telling Bill about Uncle Bartlett and he tells her it's not her fault again he's coming from a lovely place there but I love her response. She yeah. says, I know, right. you know, you don't have to tell me that I'm a strong, smart person. Yes. And again, she he she doesn't shut him down. She's just right. very clear that he mustn't baby her. Yeah. I again, Anna's choices and those moments feel authentic mm-hmm. and, and like she's really going against the cliche. And I, I just really am impressed by her. Me yeah. too. Well, speaking of more perfection, <laughs> oh, oh. Pam and Eric and Chow come to Bon Tom. I love the oh like my gosh. the worlds colliding. You guys look like aliens <laughs> in Bon Tom. <laughs> right? I know. I it really I love that scene in Relats. Oh. It's really fun, right? And I have to just take a moment here too to say like our daddies are funny. <laughs> they are funny. Freaking funny. And, you know, Stephen and Alex are funny. Yes. And I was reflecting, making my tea before getting ready on how much I was thinking I laughed more with those two men Mm. than I think I've laughed in my lifetime. Like, that's the main (laughs) thing I miss. I laughed more. I have a girlfriend where she and I get together. We we play off each other and just it's just a laugh fest. Yeah. She's a writer. But they are funny, like when, you know, Chow says, what's your score on yes. golf? And he goes, I like Long Shadow better. <laughs> it's just so funny. And I I love um, in another scene, so because you've commented on this, on how your daddy is square and mine's cool, yeah. how Alex <laughs> says, wow, the mainstreaming movement is in trouble. If you are their poster <laughs> child, it'll keep you alive, but bore you to death. Exactly. They're funny. Well, and also to give Stephen credit, you know, it's so easy. And and especially as a young actor, when I was coming to this, it's so easy to be like, oh, I want my character to be nice and cool and always make the right decisions and stuff. Like kudos to Stephen to being like, oh, a nerdy vampire. Yeah. Leaning into that. You know, (laughs) and he does. And the fact that Eric can say that to him and he can kind of be like, yeah, you know, (laughs) (laughs) oh, they had such a great. Yeah. Working relationship as well. Yeah, so we're very lucky. We have great daddies. Well, we have one of the great lines of Pam's. I mean, every time there's a scene with you, we're going to have to play a great Pam line. But as uh, Sookie is cleaning herself up in the bathroom, you guys have a little girl chat. Mm. There's vampire in your cleavage. <laughs> okay, you. <laughs> I 
love her response. Uh, oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> I know. I love that scene. And then when you guys come to Bon Tom, I love this idea that the only way Bill can play golf is on the Wii. <laughs> I, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And the way they film it, so you're up close for what, yes. so you can see that the golf course is somewhat not real. But yes, you're like, how is he outside playing? Oh, oh, oh right, you wouldn't be he able is to not. play golf. <laughs> it's really smart. And then they go and we do all these heartfelt scenes at uh, Merlots, and ah. it is. It's just weird to see Eric and Pam at Merlots. It was weird to see us there. That was fun. Do you feel out of place in all the right ways? You know, I, I don't totally remember, but I, I remember I was so new, right, that I mm. I was still figuring out how to play her and we were figuring sure. out how to dress her. And we had that kind of safari vibe dress, <laughs> you know, and uh, and that uh, will continue in the next episode. Oh, yeah. Next somebody. couple. Uh huh. <laughs> Not saying who. We don't know. We don't know. I know. <laughs> I also, I really love that that Eric, Alex, gets to make an impression at the end there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, reminding us that mm -hmm. they're not all mainstreamers. Yeah. Oh, before I go, a word of advice. We know when a human has wronged us, we can smell it. So do not make the mistake of letting the pretty blonde vampire lady on television make you feel too comfortable. <laughs> you tell him, Daddy. Oh my goodness, it's so great. It's so... It's so great. <laughs> it's ominous, and I love all... You can just hear the, like, Swedish in the uh -huh. back trying to sneak out a little bit, and it uh -huh. makes him sound, to at least my American ears, a little more ancient, you know? Yeah, I know. I think of that as ancient, too. It's Viking. Yeah. Yeah, it has that 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 feel to it. And it's great because it 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 really reminds us that just because we don't see him respond or see it, it doesn't mean it's not brewing, mm -hmm. uh, which is really good and creepy. It's, it's good really vibe. good and creepy. He he does a pass by looking at Amy Burley. He looks at Amy. He looks mm -hmm. at Royce, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so I like that everyone in that space is going, oh, God, does he mean me? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. I still have, I don't know, this funny feeling that crosses over to me personally. Like, yeah, you tell yeah. me. Like, that's right. Oh. That's right. But yes, you mentioned Amy at Merlots uh, uh -huh. that uh, Eric sort of points her out. We're going to jump into a little bit of Amy because she's starting to show her true colors, I think. Uh -huh. You know, we, we see sort of who she is at the core. You know, the, in the first place, as you know, she's done this crazy thing which is mm -hmm. kidnapping eddie mm -hmm. and harming him she throws silver on him she's unaffected by his pain yeah didn't even um, tell jason she was going to do that yeah just, 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 just went for it just went for it like this is what you do yeah. and then every time he says this is crazy she's like please be in the now with me you know it's yes <laughs> there's that great line for you that line I in response that, that is line. like i go i'm always in the now i go all these time without thinking and because i go a whole month sometimes without thinking <laughs> but it's hard to be in the now right now it's very because the great. now sucks i think it really sucks that's right. that's right yeah she really we're starting to see oh boy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there is something that's not culpable well, she, you know, she won't refer to Eddie in the first person. She keeps right. referring to him as though he's not there. And Jason uh -huh. keeps trying to speak to him. Uh -huh. um, and she's sort of trying to dissuade him. And, and, you know, it's some of what we've touched upon where she's disassociated him mm -hmm. as a, a living, I guess he's not living, but as a, you know, conscious being. Yeah, they go uh, to have sex right in right, right in front of oh. what a funny scene to film. Um right in front of Eddie and then she says, yeah. "Wait, we have to stop and like thank our food that we're killing." And she goes, "Thank you," but refers to him not in a specific she doesn't say Eddie, "Thank you." Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. First, we have to thank the vampire for the gifts that he's bestowed upon us. 
We are grateful. Fuck you. For your gift to us. Ignore him. <laughs> Like she sounds so high. <laughs> she sounds so high. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. That is so brilliant. It's and it's so brilliant, brilliant that the writers use this faux spirituality. Yes. Yeah. But you know, right after that moment, they have this amazing fantasy swimming high yeah. scene, which but I also love that scene of them having their little picnic. It's first of all, it's adorable that Jason thinks it's the adorable. trees are ticklish. Yeah. That makes me laugh. <laughs> They're laughing because they're ticklish. Is so Jason. <laughs> Aww. Eddie calls Amy a psychopath, mm-hmm. and I don't think he's that far off. You know, mm-hmm. she, you know, psychopathy is sort of defined by lack of empathy, which yes. she's shown towards Eddie. Yes. Poor behavioral controls, <laughs> which right. drug addict. You know, falling right. in love within in two a, seconds. You know, days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, antisocial behavior is sort of an interesting one that brought up because while she doesn't mm. seem antisocial, Mm-mm. she's socially controlling, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It, there's even that scene with her and Sookie mm. where it seems like such a sweet bonding moment, mm-hmm. but it's, it is Amy sort of bringing Sookie over to her side, you know, mm-hmm. it has that, that flavor to it. Yeah, and she does just start waitressing it at Merlot's as like a, a customer. She's just yeah, sitting there and all just of a sudden she starts waitressing. Jumps in on it. <laughs> I look at this thing because she talks about a lot of bad stuff has happened to her, she says, and I'm so curious right. about it because I wonder how many times, I just, the thought struck me. Yeah. Has Amy had this exact conversation? Right. How many times has she found a new person to yeah. attach herself to? Because I think that's part of the psychopathy, right? That you are always the victim. You're always the victim and you are, but you're also always in control. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, there's a line in the next episode where he says, I love you. And she says, I love you more. And it's right. like a win. It's a win for her. She right. has to be the one who's in it more, you know? Yes, I know. And it does seem sweet. But now, but as we get to know her, we're like, oh, these are all clues. God, it's taking me back throughout my dating history. If I had only known, right? Yeah. So, I, you know, I look at this stuff and go, you know, how much of this is stuff she's repeating over and over again? And then when someone like Jason is like enough mm-hmm. and leaves, mm-hmm. she gets to blame him for abandoning her rather mm. than for her kind of kidnapping someone and being incredibly violent. And that's why it's all yeah. gone down the tubes. It's the lack of responsibility. Yeah. Fascinating uh, sort of look into who she is. And Eddie says it, so he nails it. I mean, of course, he's the victim of her psychopathy, but he yeah, he has a great line. Don't do it. Don't marry her. Ain't none of your business. She's a psychopath. Hey, fuck you, she Eddie. She is. She is far more dangerous than I could ever be. That's enough! <gasps> oh, chills again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stephen Root. I can't, I'll never get over Stephen Root. I'll never get over Stephen Root. He is a legend. I mean, it's, it's, it is chilling the way he says it, because you're like... Ooh, because she does come off so lovely and so, you know, mm-hmm. sweet and real and all those things. And you are, you can see why Jason is so taken with I mean, her. she's a vegan, everything organic and vegan. Right, you know? <laughs> so you're uh, thinking this is the height of empathy. Right. And in touch with the trees and nature and the food has to be raw and organic. Right. Oh, but he doesn't, yeah. He doesn't, <laughs> but he he doesn't include in that. Uh, but also that, that. That it's more about the identity. It's what that Mm. gets her. It's the what how people look at her because of that rather than a genuine care, I feel. But those scenes with Eddie and Jason between those two characters just never uh, that just every time I see them and we've watched to do this podcast, we're watching the episodes (laughs) a lot, like four or five times each episode. And and I go to fast forward through looking for who we're interviewing and I can't fast forward through yeah. those scenes. No, they're so good. And Steven, you know, gave us a lot of really incredible insight into what he mm-hmm. was working on there. And I just love what it does for Jason. You know, this idea that Eddie talks about that he was living a lie. Yeah. Even when he didn't know what that lie was. Right. And I think that's something Jason can relate to, even though he's not sure what his lie is either something is missing that this is why he's kind of coping with women and with, you know, certain behaviors and and drugs, Mm -hmm. you know, and next season. Oh boy. 
Yes. Oh boy. Oh yeah, boy. With religion as trying to find that, himself. You know? That's the next drug. Exactly. Um, mm-hmm. So it's it's just really amazing to see like the male bonding Jason never got. That's it. Yeah. And now for a quick bite, tech support. A ringtone can say an awful lot about a person. This season, we've collected two such examples, beginning with Andy Belfler. We take a look back at 107. While fishing, Andy receives a call, and his ring is easily recognized as the Hawaii Five O theme song. Perhaps it's a little workplace inspiration for Andy, hoping to book him Dano. We also have Jason's ringtone in 106. This, my dear friends, is an original composed exclusively for the show. And here it is in all its glory. And if you couldn't quite make that out, the lyrics there are shake that ass, motherfucker, shake that ass over and over and over. (laughs) Okay, well, turns out the temp track they had originally just wasn't as aggressively sexist as the writers were looking for. So music supervisor Gary Calamar asked a friend to write the most obnoxious thing they could think of. And this lively number, attributed to the Sly Dolls, was the result. Truest Blood Tech Support will be with you again shortly. Please stay on the line. I'm very excited because we're getting into (laughs) special effects today. Yes. This was a lot of blood. It was. We're specifically (laughs) going to talk about the gallons and gallons of blood that we use on this show. Yeah, what did Uh, he say? How many gallons of blood like per gallons of blood? For uh, Long Shadow. Uh, so yeah, we'll start. We'll jump right in with Long Shadow. We spoke with Michael Arbogast, who is our special effects foreman on the show. He worked with a whole department of special effects. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, he let us in a little bit on how they do what they do. But Kristen, you were there that day I when was. they staked Long Shadow. What was the vibe? The vibe was like, we've all been waiting for this movie to come out for months. <laughs> and we've stayed in line to get tickets and we got our popcorn ahead of time so we wouldn't miss the first five minutes. And we got in our seats 30 minutes early. I mean, it was it was really the first time we staked someone, right? So it was. there was this vibe. I think everyone on the set wanted to get it right. And right. Um, it was interesting for God Love Anna again because... She had to take that 10 gallons Oof. of blood base in the face. I remember the director yelling out at the last moment, make sure your eyes are open. Oh, <laughs> right. Because it's, you know, when you know it's coming, you want to prepare. Yes. But also we want the natural flinch reaction. We just don't right. want it to come too soon. <laughs> That's it. And she did. Yeah. Or she got hit right oh. in the face with that hose of blood. And you know, there's always producers and writers coming in and out at Video Village, and you don't always see them. You, you know, they're vid- it's not always viewable from the set. You kind of have to leave the set and walk around the corner. I left the set and walked around the corner, and there was every producer and writer at Video wow. Village. Just like everyone was eagerly this is the anticipating. fun part. Yeah. Well, I think one thing to point out that, again, viewers may not know, so a shot like that, the cleanup is so intense yeah. You really only get one or two shots at it. So mm-hmm. you had Anna for the first, um, you know, initial mm-hmm. blood pour, and you maybe have her stunt double, which you could shoot from behind or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, Heidi to get had it to again. take it too. Right. Mm-hmm. But that's it. You ca- They're kind of going to get two shots, one from the front and one from the back, to get that first initial hit. So there's a lot of pressure. That's for it a to really go good right. point because it's a good yeah. three hours it to is. go wash this actress. Wash your hair, well, blow it, dry her over. hair, redo the whole thing. So they don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, now, once she's bloodied and you're happy with the shot, you can keep pouring blood on her and cut into it yep. later. Uh, but it's an it's a pressured moment. Uh, so, it's you know, here's moment. Michael himself telling us a little bit about what his part of that was. Myself and Louis Nigro, who was our helper at that time, just climbed up in the rafters above where Long Shadow was. And we strung his pants up with monofilament, his clothes, 
And we just sat up there and tipped buckets over of blood. And yeah, and then and the spray out of the mouth was a really cool rig that Dan Rebert in Masters Effects came up with that was a mouthpiece that went and fit right in his mouth. And the tube came out the side and ran down. And they were back there with a big plunger like a giant syringe trying to push the blood out it was a lot going into this the mouth rig you had a mouth rig in later seasons in later seasons so Mm -hmm. i I have a little experience with the mouth rig. but even that's funny like the collaboration right so it's yes it's michael up in the in the rafters dan setting this up this other bit and so you know he's working with a lot of different people to make this happen yes um we also talked about tina the cat Tina that was another cat. big blood oh moment gosh. this episode. And as Michael put it, it was uh, the first time he got in trouble good. Mike came in to me and he said, this is, they're going to have a cat swinging up on the thing. He, it doesn't have to have blood coming off of it, but they want blood to come across Anna's face. And he says, it's a close-up shot. You can just take a paintbrush and flick it and get some on her face, and that's what it is. But when we got to the shot that night, you remember from the dining room, there was like an opening into the foyer, right? That's where I was, and Anna was by the stairs. And the camera was seeing the whole room. So there was no way for me to get close. (sighs) Trying to hit her was like, uh, I just wasn't getting it. And they kept flipping it, and they kept going, and it kept going. And I wasn't hitting her. And finally, we got her. But by the end of that time, and the shot was good, done, we got it. There was blood. And yeah, for cleaning blood up, because that was early on, it was a mess. And, and we tried to clean everything up. And the set, usually the set decorators are there and props helping you. They're all together. It kind of everybody jumped in. It was a really good group the whole time. Yeah, by the end of the first season, they just realized that we're going to have to like get people to come in and clean up. I love this idea <laughs> of a cleanup crew. That <laughs> yes, who are these people? Right, that blood is so messy. <laughs> just trying to get one a little bit of blood across her face, <laughs> and he, you know, splattered blood all over Grands. The whole set. The, the he said it was all the way to the fireplace. Yes. Yeah, that's a funny job, right? I guess. Yeah. I mean, do they also work on CSI and all the procedurals, <laughs> and then, you know, on their but yeah, their week they, off? on the later seasons, we actually had a cleanup crew that would come in after the very bloody scenes and either prepare spaces so that the blood wouldn't get on them or uh, figure that out. But also you you've talked about and I remember this blood became a real issue for continuity. Yeah. Blood is a big deal. It's a big deal. As soon as you get splattered with blood and you might be in the same look for many, many episodes and that has to be across your cheek created exactly the same which every is very time. difficult and you're shooting the scenes out of order mm-hmm. too so that that became i remembering a sequence later in seasons that was really intense so we we mm-hmm. did get to the point where we were like you'll notice <laughs> as the seasons go we've got it on our neck our chest yeah. not in the hair not in the hair <laughs> not in the face <laughs> because that's too focused to know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's really hard to have an actress in the scene who's not right next to you, two feet away, and you've got to now splatter her when Tina goes around that yeah. helicopter fan and that blood hits her face. It's... <laughs> <laughs> this is the technical aspects where there's just no way to perfect it. You have to just sit there and try to hit someone in the face with blood. What I think is so wonderful, you know, Michael, as as one nerd to another, <laughs> I just, my heart loves him so much because yes. he feels like that little kid who just yes. loved playing with stuff and slingshotting things yes. and making little, you know, gags and so forth. And he grew up into a man who gets to do that for a living and yeah, just playing with goo and figuring yeah. out how to make it different consistencies and create nernies. <laughs> yeah. And getting better all the time, improving it constantly. And I, I have this image 
of walking by the sound stages and seeing Michael on a tarp outside with yeah. mannequins yeah. and just buckets and tubes of blood and, and goose just shooters. Like, like Dexter, right? Just like flinging yes. blood everywhere, yeah. trying to get it right. And like, I, hey, you know, Arbo, hey, yeah, just the doing like hundred percent commitment to making it as good as it could be. Yeah, and he, yeah, that's the wonderful thing. Everyone had this m- commitment. Alan Ball, we got the time we needed. He commented on this too. Yeah, he he got the time he needed to make it right to practice it do it and even redo it and even reshoot it if it had to if, be if done. they needed it when yes. he, he talked a little bit about the different types of blood and the different things they do to it to mm-hmm. make it work yes for for different delivery methods via coming spraying out of a rig out of your mouth or anything that's usually thinner right so because it travels easier through the tubing and all that it depended on what we were doing and, and how we were throwing it out or what it was supposed to be. There were some shots when I put peanut butter in the blood so it would stick to the wall when it hit it. Um, there were different recipes. Because remember, we had those PVC, the goose shooters is what we called them. And we would just come out and load them up. And um, it depended on what it was. I added stuff sometimes. Sometimes I thinned it out. And the best thing about the show was I felt they gave me the time and let me do what I needed to do. I would do blood gags and and play with it outside the stage right up until we would shoot it. And and Mike would always say, "Why why do you do that? Why do you change stuff? Because my mind was always like, I can make this better. Yeah, goo shooter. That's just the, <laughs> it. Just makes me laugh that there's a name for it. I know. Of course, there's a name for it. They got to call course. it something. They got to bring they the goo shooter. Say, Hand me the thing that makes the red stuff propel yeah. at an actor. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, he talked about too, like you know, that there again, it's the, it's this collaboration, right? Yeah. If, it, if it's going to get too close to an actor, they've got to bring in makeup. But they're trying to add to the effect. If it's CGI, how can mm. they? How can they throw in some real blood so that you don't see this? You don't see the seam between the visual effect right. and the practical effect. Right. And I love that they all kind of got to work together to make the best looking special effect they could. I mean, we have staking in this show. We have dismemberment sure, on this show. Sure, we drank there's a lot of blood. Well, I did drinking but... of blood. Yes, and there's goo. So we promise we. This is not the last word on blood. No, in it's fact, not. Even Next episode, I have some blood stories you I can share. have a story to share. <laughs> but we all have stories. Yeah, Boy, we, we do. blood stories. We do. Well, no cast member on the show could escape working with blood. And even Carrie Preston is no exception. <laughs> Her delicious take on Arlene Fowler involves a bit of blood, a slice of love, an enormous amount of talent. Yes. So let's find out what that is all about. Well, thank you, Carrie. We're so excited to talk to you um, about season one. Um, we hope you'll come back and talk with us again, though, because obviously there are many, many more things in store for our league. Absolutely. Lead. I'm so happy to be here. It, we, usually we start with how'd you get the job, but but I want <laughs> to ask you about how what it was like to be a human yeah. on this crazy show. I know. It was, um, I mean... There were times, I'm not going to lie, that I was jealous, you know, of, of, <laughs> of the supernaturals because you always got to do all the cool, you know, the cool special effects stuff. And, right. you know, there was always blood and there was, you know, it was a show about true blood. I was very excited, you know, at some point when some blood, I'm not going to spoil anything, came into, you know, my life um, as Arlene. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. And I was so excited. I celebrated. I'm like, I'm finally on True Blood. It's oh, so <laughs> <You know>. funny. <laughs> but um, but I loved playing Arlene. I loved it because, um, you know, she had such a she has such a great arc. Like yes. we really get to see her start off one way, and at the end of the seven years, um, it would be completely different. You know, and yes. and that was. That was thrilling. And like I was just saying, 
the show doesn't work if these vampires and these supernatural characters don't exist in the real world. Mm-hmm. Right. It doesn't because then we don't understand what it is that they're pushing against. Yeah. We don't understand yes. what world it is that they've been disenfranchised from. Yeah. And so I felt like a great, you know, responsibility yeah. as a, a, a human character, as a as a Southern uh, uh, born yeah. and raised, you know, I, I was raised yes. in Georgia, you know, to represent those Char- those people that I grew up with, those women in particular, mm-hmm. in a way mm-hmm. that, you know, kept them grounded. I understood that I was being, you know, given this, um, you know, opportunity, but also responsibility to serve up some humor in the midst <laughs> of, you know, yes. some, some, some dark stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, doing that and, and at the same time, you know, keeping the character real as well you know which was Very you could much. say tonally that's the whole show too yeah you know that walking <laughs> that fine line you know yeah um but so I love I loved that and I loved you know that um they trusted me with that yeah. you know yeah well, even yes. in that first season you talk about growth and we start with Arlene going you know Sookie don't date a vampire it's dangerous she's on that side and literally that last episode you're like yay vampire marriage in Vermont you know it's it is such a great even in one season to see how far you take Arlene I think it's so yeah cool. yeah I know I was very grateful for that you know um because you know having you could say it's racism or homophobia mm-hmm. or whatever it is those are fears that yeah people can move beyond, you know, right. they can move beyond. And I think that's what the show, you know, does so beautifully is it, it teaches tolerance and, you know, acceptance. And now I'm getting, I'm going to cry. <laughs> a little teared up. I know, right. It's really a big deal. I think it's a big deal. Yeah. And there's a quote online I, I found with you saying this, mm. where people can just enjoy the icing on the cake and the entertainment value but there are deeper layers mm-hmm. that we're infusing into people's homes, mm-hmm. homes that maybe we couldn't get into with these topics mm-hmm. otherwise. I think yep. it's a really big deal because every generation is showing to be more accepting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And I, I think yeah. television is is a big part of that. Yeah. yeah. I think, you know, stories have the power to change the world and they have since the beginning of time, you know, they have since the Greek tragedies and on, you know, and, um, Alan understands that, you know, and I think that's why he responded to those books from the get go was, Oh, huh. This is a way I can talk about some things that are important to me and the us as actors, you know, to go, Oh, huh. I could make a little statement about, you know, how how, uh, how to be how to be vulnerable and grounded and also you know close-minded and racist you know <laughs> yes. because it's necessary you know yeah. for the storytelling yeah. it's necessary to create these three four dimensional characters yeah. so that people don't get turned off and that people don't feel like they are being made fun of yeah you you yes. play Arlene with such car- compassion I feel and even in the moments where her mind is closed we see we see the cracks and we see where she has this huge heart that if you can reach her <laughs> you know it yeah. can really make a difference and i just it's it's a it's a really compelling she's a really compelling character and you are so compelling playing her to see mm-hmm. all of those different mm-hmm. sides and you know we go on to talk a lot about the facility you have with comedy and drama i think as you just mentioned the kind of going yes. back and forth between those two But I know we want to talk about how you got the job as well, but I want to ask about your process too. So where do you want to start? (laughs) Should we start with casting? (laughs) Yeah, sure. Sure, sure, sure. How'd you get the job? I did this movie with Alan Ball um, that he wrote and directed called Towelhead. I was on set one day and I, you know, said to him, what are you doing next? You know, because he had done Six Feet Under, Towelhead, you know. And he said, well, it's funny you should ask, you know, I'm doing this show about vampires for, it's a pilot for HBO. And I said, vampires? 
years. <laughs> what? I mean, that's what you got? <laughs> and I just, it, it, I mean, I couldn't make sense of it in my head. But then he said, um, and I might have something for you in it. And I was like, well, that sounds good, you know, because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have anything lined up. So, um, so he said, yeah, you know, we'll send it to your agent. So I, I got the script, read the whole pilot, top to bottom. No idea what character he was talking about. <laughs> oh. I was like, wait a minute, which part does he mean? Because right. at the time I was blonde, you know, right. I, you know, I was born, right. you know, I have blonde hair and stuff. And, you know, the character is described in, you know, in a physically as something very different from me, right? <laughs> Buxom, right. Right, you know, redhead, right. brassy, you know, little trashy, all these things. And I was like, huh, that that's not usually how I get cast. But, um, yeah, but they, they were like, no, it's, it's Arlene. And I was like, great, great. So, you know, I put in some chicken cutlets on in the bra <laughs> and, you know, put on a tight skirt. You know what I mean? I teased my hair up, got some cigarettes and went in and read for him. And that was it. I didn't have to test. It was amazing. They wow. just, they just filmed that one audition and he just bless his soul just went to HBO and said this is who I want for Arlene and they said okay so I mean oh, this doesn't always amazing. happen <laughs> listeners this doesn't always happen so this um, does not happen it really doesn't so that was a, a true blessing and uh and then we were off to the races yeah yeah the we call those things you put in your bra chicken cutlets <laughs> Yeah, we yeah, do. So we I don't think you, you went I don't to Kroger's and just picked up. <laughs> that's right. true. I should, I, should have, I should have clarified that. Right. Yes, there are these little uh, silicone, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, little, uh, you know, they, they kind of hoist things up. They give and you they some, do look like boneless, skinless. They look like chicken cutlets. <laughs> chicken cutlets. So we call yeah. them chicken cutlets. Chicken yeah. cutlets. You can slap them around. And, yeah. And then, you know, there, there I wore those for, for seven, seven years. So I wore one for seven years because this may be TMI, but I am lopsided. No. Right? And I always had to be in these booby things. So I wore one chicken cutlet. It was always funny for me when I'd come in and they had those black velvet trays in your trailer. So your clothes would be hanging and my jewelry would be laid out, my earrings, my bracelet, and there'd be one chicken cutlet. (laughs) Yeah, we had we had a very special, super super foamy push up bra that I would put those chicken cutlets in to. So I had <laughs> major major major. But I mean, it's because the character, you know, the way she was mm-hmm. described. We, like I really wanted that shape, and yeah, um, I know you guys have talked a lot about Audrey Fisher, but you know, Danny Glicker um, was the original costume designer, and yeah. he, you know, he created that iconic. Merlot's uniform. Yeah. Oh, right. He designed that iconic Merlot's uniform. And the amount of care and time that he spent on just that T-shirt mm. and making that T-shirt seem like, oh, it's just a casual T-shirt. It wasn't. You know, it had a certain <laughs> scoop neck. All no. of it was designed to give us, as the waitresses, a silhouette Right. That, you know, was was flattering, um, but it get distracted a little bit from it trying to be too sexy or sexual. Right. There was a purity sure. to it. I mean, it was a lot. And then those aprons that would center our waist in. I mean, all <laughs> that stuff was, you know, handled with a great amount of skill and care. And that's okay. what I wore you know, yeah. seven for seven years. I mean, I had other great costumes that, you know, Audrey put me in over the, over the years, but, you know, always anchored into that, that That's Merlots. So you know. interesting, right? They didn't just go buy Hanes t-shirts and iron no. on the Merlots thing. No, right. and they were, and they were tailored for each of us. You oh know, we would, my they gosh, were tailored I in. never thought about that. Huh. You're a chameleon <laughs> and your wig and then how oh God, you decided yeah. to get rid of it. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. how you had to wait for the opportunity. That's so interesting. I know. Yeah. We've, so we've heard multiple stories from people saying that when they met you, they were like, 
who is this? Why is she asking me questions? And suddenly it dawns on them, oh my God, that's Carrie. Uh, that yeah. that it, it's such an iconic look as Arlene that for those first few seasons, <laughs> it was, I know. yeah, you and were too was, much of a chameleon, yeah. It was, yeah, and it, it became a, a, a what I like to call a branding issue mm. because I didn't, nobody knew I was on that show. <laughs> that was this huge hit. So I was like, right. hmm, how am I going to? So I'll go back a little bit and yes, say um, I I was shooting another project at the same time that we shot the pilot. So this wasn't Alan's movie. It was another film. And I was a blonde in that film. I had short blonde hair. And I could not dye my hair because as soon as we wrapped on the pilot, I had to go back and finish shooting this movie. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and the character was so, is so in the books and I'm um, in the pilot, such an iconic redhead. And so um, the first wig that they put me in, y'all. It was like <laughs> strawberry shortcake, or it was not good. It was not so good because we were trying. You know, a pilot is fast, right? They yeah, shoot right. these things fast, right? Fast. And so they're like, "Oh my god, a wig! That is not easy just to come up with because right. you got to have a lace front. It's got to lay down. It yeah. cannot mm -hmm. look like a wig, mm -hmm. and they're expensive. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're doing this thing, and." I come in and they're like, oh God, she can't, she can't dye her hair. So they put this synthetic wig on and I'm so agreeable, you know, I'm so agreeable. <laughs> Me yeah. too. And I was like, okay, and <laughs> oh, okay. this is okay. I'm not going to write it into the, the backstory. Boat. Yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to rock the boat. So but player. thankfully we had great people, you know, yeah. at the helm and, you know, Danny Glicker, who was doing yeah. the costumes at the time, he was like, I think we need to maybe explore some other options. So, you know, it's, it's everybody just like, everybody was just very kind and they were like, okay. And so, um, we all agreed that that wasn't going to be the wig. And so, um, <laughs> they went to a restaurant rental house and they got a wig that was I don't know if this is true or not but we were told was Gwyneth one of Gwyneth Paltrow's wigs oh. from I think Iron Man maybe I'm yeah. not sure what project it was during Has that time good that she had yeah. worn and um it fit my head and yeah. we really didn't have to do much of an adjustment at all on the on the lace or anything and it just laid down really nicely nice. so the wig became Gwenny. Oh. so <laughs> Gwenny, Gwenny was my wig oh. and um you know and and when you set it and if the pilot happens and then the next episode picks up right where that episode left off and right. the next episode yeah. the next there's no time in the script built in for me to actually change my look. So yeah. I was wearing that wig for I don't know how many seasons and I would go to the premieres and I would show up on the carpet and people would be like, next. And I would be like, oh, you know, and right. I play Arlene and literally uh, somebody said to me, no, you don't on a red <gasps> carpet. No, oh you don't. Oh my gosh. I said, yes, I do. I do. And then of course, you know, I got a publicist from, you know, who, right. who would walk me down the carpet. But at the beginning, you know, yeah. I showed yeah. people didn't even know. And so then I decided, okay, well, I guess when we finally got to a place in the script where we had a time jump of like four months, I, you know, we all changed our looks. <laughs> <laughs> we all were like, yes. So, you know, people got haircuts, people. And, um, and so I, you know, lost the wig and dyed my hair red and have not looked back, you yeah. know, and that's been a long time now. And then I started getting other work as as a redhead. So it was a good career move, you know, yeah, yeah, to do that because then people could connect the dots. That is you know. so funny. Gwenny. Yeah. I like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know. So we know how you got cast. We know how you got the look down for you when you were first reading the first scripts for Arlene and this character, what were the things that like that stood out to you, that you were excited about, scared about, you know, what were kind of your first impressions? Um, well, I wanted to, like I said earlier, I really wanted to honor this woman and this this type of woman, a, you know, mm. working class woman who is unlucky in love and, mm. you know, is is not a kid who who has her own 
children who, you know, is trying to give them a good life, trying to make ends meet, you know, as a waitress, you know, that that's a very specific thing to want to continue to do. It's hard on the body, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, and her, her sense of pride about it, about loving working there, Mm -hmm. um, the way, you know, just trying to make her legs look good, always had a manicure, always wearing makeup, like really, you know, taking care of herself to present herself at, at work, but also, you know, to hopefully find some love in her life. And, yeah. you know, Renee seemed like, <laughs> an, seems like the answer to all of that. And, you know, that, so all that stuff was fun. I, I like this camaraderie that we have this, this female yes. camaraderie, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the women supporting each other in this yes. place mm-hmm. of work, yeah, I love you know, that. because we see so many times women tearing each other down yeah. and in stories. And so, uh, I, I really love that part as well. Um, and then, and, and, and I include Lafayette in that, mm-hmm. you know, because he was such a part of the kind of girl team, you know, yes. in his, in his camaraderie, you know, um, yeah. the way he would tease us and the way we would tease, tease each other. And, and that was also, you know, whenever, and you guys have talked about this on the podcast, but whenever Nelson got on a hold of, that character, other things would come out of his mouth, you know, yes. that maybe weren't even on the page. And if you were in a scene with him, you couldn't help but riff as well, you right. know, and and that would be the one time where you felt comfortable, like letting things fly, like that moment, <laughs> that great scene in the pilot where, <laughs> you know, Lynn Collins and, and Anna yes. and... <laughs> Nelson and myself were doing this scene and we started riffing. We were shooting that at like three in the morning. We were exhausted. <laughs> and Lynn Collins starts slapping herself on the behind. And he's <laughs> saying, you know, and I start saying peaches and cream, peaches and cream. Oh, and yeah. he's saying cocoa yeah. and cocoa. And it's just <laughs> all of that was just us playing, you know. And oh. I love that about the show as, as much as we honored the writing, there were those moments that we were given some freedom to, you know, let, let those characters fly. And that's such a great moment that that happened right in the pilot. Yeah, I know, I know. And, and, and you could, you could feel like I could feel when we were doing the pilot, we were, we were making something different and something Mm. special. Um, I wasn't sure. We weren't sure if it was going to be like cheesy, you know, like, is it Mm going to be Mm -hmm. cheesy? But Mm -hmm. you would be doing it and then you would look in the monitor, you know, and then you would see what the cameras were getting and you would go, wow. Yeah. Well, that's interesting when like thinking about that and the personal relationships, because when you're first starting a job and you don't know each other and yet you have to play these characters Mm -hmm. who are best friends and work together and it's so it's so cool to hear that it's almost like you all had sunk right into that in the very first episode. It was that, was it a quick friendship that built or trust? Yeah. How was that like getting to know all those people? Yeah. Well, you know, Anna is such a pro, you know, yeah. and mm-hmm. she's been doing this her entire yeah. life. And so she bring, she's our cast leader, right? And yeah. so she yes. brought that level of professionalism to uh she set the tone with that Mm, yes and then in particular that scene that I was just talking about you know I wasn't in school with Nelson and Lynn but we all went to the same school you know and so there was that that level of trust that you have with people that you go oh we were in Vietnam together okay 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 you know (laughs) like we I I get it you know I get I get where you are we can play together I can trust you to catch me if I fall and all that and so Uh. And you could say that for everyone that was cast. I mean, the the casting was really extraordinary, you know. Um, It was. You would come on set and you would go, oh, I got to keep up, you know. Right. I got to keep up with these. And you wanted to. You wanted to, you know, rise to to their level. And I I swear it started with Anna. There was never a moment that that woman wasn't fully 100% prepared. Never a moment. Oh, yeah. Never. 
What do you miss about like when you reflect back on it? What do you what do you not miss and what do you miss? <laughs> oh, I miss walking into that bar. Yeah. yeah. You know, just walking into that bar like they made that you know, they made that on a stage. <laughs> right. And That's you crazy. never felt like you were on a stage never. when you, I mean, I would walk in there and I would be like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm at work in this, this bar that exists in Louisiana. And, you know, just that feeling. And, the, and ne- I never got tired of looking at it. Mm-hmm. There was always something in there to look at. And it felt, it just felt, I felt so comfortable in there. And I was always excited, you know, to drive up to the lot, yeah, you know, park my car and go, wow, I get to go into that bar today, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it was just, oh. yeah, it was yeah. just so, I really miss that. And, you know, you don't know, you don't know what you got till it's gone, right? Sometimes. Yeah. I but I, I, I would pinch myself, you know, and say, no, 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 <laughs> you you know, this is, let's appreciate this because it, it's, it's not it's not going to always be here, you know, and we were lucky that it got to be there for seven years. And, you know, that is most shows don't, don't make it past one year, you know, or a pilot. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember, especially with the Merlot set because the Merlot set was enclosed. Like a lot of the other sets, if you walked around a wall, you'd be on the stage, but there was a door. There was no way out of the Merlot set except literally through a door in the bar yeah, and oh, I think the lighting helped as well. It was so well lit that mm-hmm. even at 3 a.m., if it was lit like it was midday, it yeah. felt that way. Yeah. And it was so jarring to step off, like step out I of know. Merlots into a soundstage that yeah. I remember being like, oh. can, can I keep my cast chair like in the office or something like I kind of want to stay yeah. on set because <laughs> it was yeah. so weird to go oh. back and forth. So it was almost like once I'm on Merlots. I just kind of yeah. want to stay in Merlots until we yeah. wrap today. It was strange how interesting, perfectly isolating in a way. <laughs> that it really was. was. It, it took really you was. out of L.A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the back and the kitchen, it, it was yeah. a fully, you know, functioning. Ca- like they would yeah. cook things back there and Completely stuff. Completely integral. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. It was pretty wow. great. Wow. Yeah. Love That's that so place. cool. You like worked in a bar. You had a cheers. <laughs> Yeah, and you go behind the bar, and like we would draw little pictures on napkins that would stay yeah. there, you know, all for yeah. all seven years. It'd be like, oh, and those little what do you call them? The pads, yeah, like your, pads. Your order yeah. pads, yeah. the order pads, yeah, the order yeah. pads. Yeah, I mean, I would fill those up, you know, by the end of the day, and <laughs> yes. like, oh, right. I had, I came up with my own abbreviations for you know, oh. C B, you know, C B and a C, and you know, cheeseburger and a coke, oh, and like I, gosh. you know, came up with my, own, you know, because this is what I, I was doing that. all day. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. So I filled up. Some you could of those have paths. applied for a job working as a waitress after that and said, I worked at Merlot's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And one of us could have been <laughs> the person they call to check on your references. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you uh, well, did you take anything from Merlot's? I did. I took a, a wooden sign that said homemade pies. Ah. Mm, yeah, cute, I have that cute, hanging cute. in, uh, in oh, my kitchen. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you, Carrie. This is oh fantastic. my gosh! Thank you, Carrie. Thank you so much. It was incredible to hear about the Merlot show that you were on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was so amazing to catch up. How amazing, how lovely yeah. to connect with Carrie, to yeah. see her. We got to see her, but to hear her responses. Mm-hmm. Oh. She's such a, a like a, a, a consistent force throughout this show, right? She She's the, the bubbling heart and energy underneath this series. And, you know, there's sort of a core group of people that I think represent yeah. that. And Arlene is right in the forefront <laughs> creating yes. this world. Yes. I know. It's so interesting to think about the human versus the vampires, yeah. but she's just so brilliant, talented, solid, funny, yes. heartfelt. Well, I think to talk, uh, you know, we, we've talked to a lot of actors this season who fit that chameleon character actor, yeah. you know, actor to the core kind of person. These are these yeah. are not just personalities or yeah. charismatic human beings. They are that, but they are deeply interesting and interested performers. That's the difference between trying to be interesting or interested. 
Exactly. I think every cast member was really a character actor. Mm. Next week on Truest Blood, we get to sit down with the one and only Sam Trammell. Yeah. A.K.A. Dean the dog. <laughs> 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 but of course, also the enigmatic Sam Rolot. And we have a lot of ground to cover with him. Yeah. So uh, hold on to your spoiler hats. Many of our favorite characters must finally face the music next episode mm. as their past actions come back to bite them. Literally, in some yeah, cases. I know. I was going to say too many puns. And then I'm like, no, nope, <laughs> no, nope, that's actually literal. Just and we enough. get just enough. And we get a first look. And a new Bon Tom regular, somebody, not saying who, but her character <laughs> name is Jessica Hamby. Oh, my. Oh, my. Who could that well, be? Thank, who could that be? Well, thanks for listening, Trubies. Subscribe and follow wherever you listen to your podcasts, and we'll see you next week. Y'all come back now, you hear? Truest Blood is produced by Safe Haven for HBO Max. Executive producers are Janina Gavonkar, Kristen Bauer, and Deborah Ann Wool. Our producer is Gabrielle Gallon, and our audio producer is Christopher Wool. Our theme song was recorded just for this podcast by Jace Everett. Additional music was composed by Timo Chen. And remember, you can watch all of the original episodes of True Blood on HBO Max. Truest Blood.